Welcome to More Living with Jim Brogan, your source of information for living the best years of your life, your way. For more than a decade, host Jim Brogan and his expert guests have come together each week to share important news and advice that can impact the lives and well-being of those who are retired and those nearing retirement. Learn about issues like health and fitness, financial planning, social security benefits, investment advice, and more. And now, here's the host of More Living, Jim Brogan. Good morning, East Tennessee, and welcome to More Living with Jim Brogan, where it's all about living the best years of your life your way. This is News Talk 98.7 WOKI, and... We've got a great show in store for you. You know, life is unpredictable. The unexpected happens. Insurance coverages are a huge impact on how we deal with things. And health care is such a huge issue. If you look at health care expenses in retirement, it's anticipated to be approximately $280,000 in health care expenses in a retirement, in a normal retirement. Now, in my dollars and cents segment, I'm going to talk about that issue specifically. How big of a planning issue is that? And how do you plan in your financial plan for health care expenses in retirement? But health care reform in this country and how we get access to care and, and good insurance It's been such a huge topic. It's been in the media. Of course, we had the Affordable Care Act. But the average person, health care and insurance is associated with a lot of confusion. And Republican Republican efforts to repeal major portions of the Affordable Care Act in 2017 were unsuccessful. Uh, There were some executive orders. Premiums continued to fluctuate sky high in, 16, in, in 17 and 18. Now, now, or the last couple of years, this past year, premiums did not escalate nearly as highly. But how do you navigate the confusion and decide on a plan that fits your life and your budget? With me in the studio, I have Kevin Craigenbrink, a good friend of mine, an insurance benefit specialist and leadership development coach and professional for more than 40 years. His company, 3 to 99, is a service-first, team-focused company that works uh, with small and medium-sized employers when it comes to employee benefits. So, Certainly, dealing with health insurance and what happens when you leave an employer, you know, and you have to have individual coverage. What if you retire early and you need to get to Medicare age? We're going to get into all of that today. Before I do get to Kevin, I do want to mention it is the, the conditions outside today with all the rain. And Kevin and I were talking about this off air. I have never seen this much standing water on the roads. So if you're just getting out or you're about to get out, please be careful. You need to allow extra time to get where you're going. You don't need to be going 70 miles an hour on the interstates. The interstates, Pellissippi Parkway, the main roads all have standing water. So please be careful out on the roads this morning, and please allow extra time to get where you're going to need to go, and please be patient with other drivers. I know we get all wound up. I do it too. Be patient. Because there's a tremendous risk out there right now. I have never in my life here in Knoxville, Tennessee, I've never seen conditions like this that I can recall. Okay, enough on that. Kevin Craigenbrink, we're going to talk about health insurance. Good morning, Kevin. Welcome to More Living. Good morning, Jim. Thanks for having me on the show. Looking forward to the conversation. It's great to have you back. Let, let's kind of dive right in here, Kevin. Health care reform, certainly a big, big topic. Many people are confused What's gone into effect? What has not go in, gone into effect? Were that what were changes that didn't pass? There's a lot of confusion. Can you just talk overall about the changes in healthcare from your perspective in 2019? And and we certainly should get into the fact that the individual mandate did go away. So that's certainly a big thing that happened last year. But from your perspective, what are the big changes? Or not changes. Yeah, you're right. So, so that's kind of the, the, the irony there, Jim, is that there's really not a lot of change in the actual law. In fact, the, the individual mandate didn't even really go away. The only thing that went away was the penalty. So technically, the Affordable Care Act still requires every individual to have health insurance coverage. 
And so if you go read the law, it hasn't changed a bit. What, what, what the, the executive order did was say, well, there won't be any penalty if you don't have coverage. Well, that makes it kind of a toothless law, though, doesn't it? It does. In effect, there is no individual mandate, at least no enforceable individual mandate, because there's no coercive effect anymore. They, that, that's, uh, and that's why you're seeing now new lawsuits about the whole thing, because if there's no coercive effect to it, then it's bad law. That's right. Yeah. And, and so, uh, so there are several states now that have entered into lawsuits to see if they can get the entire thing thrown out again. Most of them uh, uh, from, well, all of those states involved in those lawsuits are Republican-led states, uh, sort of taking a, a backdoor approach to try and, 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 uh, and eliminate the Affordable Care Act itself. Now, in 2018, though, people are getting ready to file their tax returns. It still existed for 2018. If somebody didn't get their individual insurance, they still could have a penalty. That is correct. And there's a lot of misunderstanding around that. So, yeah, as people file their taxes this year, they may find that if they did not have coverage last year, they could face a penalty because that penalty was still in effect for 20. 20- 18. Right. And so then now this year, 2019, now it's a what gone away. The, the penalty is gone. That is correct. Now, but, but all of the same other characteristics of the marketplace and, and all of the things that go with that are still in place. They, they function basically the same. The, the, the ways in which you qualify for subsidies or don't qualify are effectively the same. And actually, we'll get into folks. Just t- stay tuned. We're going to get into how those subsidies work. Yeah. Now, what about the corporate mandate? Corporate mandate did not change. Uh, and so, you, you know, the, the, the corporate mandate to create, to, to provide health insurance for employees kicks in at 50. Uh, so any employer that has 50 full-time equivalent employees, that means it's a combination not just of the total number of employees, uh, but those that have a full-time equivalent. So if you had, you, you could have 70 employees and not hit the full-time equivalent of 50 if a good portion of those are part-time. So it's not an absolute number 50, but 50 full-time equivalent, then the corporate mandate kicks in. Below that number, employers have options to provide health insurance coverage or not. Okay, we and the big things I want to get into today, we're going to get into subsidies. How does that work? What if you retire before you're 65? We may get a little into Medicare, not a lot. Uh, we've done past Medicare shows and will continue to do future shows just for Medicare. But right now, we're going to talk overall about the health care landscape and also the expenses you have. But as we had, you know, health care reform is so hotly debated. I mean, it's one of the top two or three political issues when people, when they're polled, what's important to you and likely to be a very focal point in the 2020 presidential election. In your opinion, Kevin, what does the future of the Affordable Care Act look like for individuals? Do you think it could go away entirely? I, I think it could go away entirely, but I, I think, you know, depending on how the political landscape shakes out, and, and, you know, I don't think anybody who says they can actually predict this as being honest, I don't think we can, but I do think this, you know, if uh, we get to the, the, the next election cycle in 2020 and, uh, and, de- and Democrats gain control of both houses and, and the White House, then I think we would see an expansion of the Affordable Care Act, a move toward, if not an actual implementation of some for- form of single-payer system. Uh, we'd see a move in that direction. If the Democrats got all three. Exactly correct. Uh, barring that... I think, uh, let me say this first. I don't see any, personally, I don't see any environment in the next decade where the Affordable Care Act or some element of it isn't always in place. Some pieces of that, I think, are pretty broadly accepted now and aren't going to go away. So I don't think we'll see an environment where we lose, for example, a guaranteed coverage for pre-existing conditions, which is one of the bedrock principles of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, I think we will have a lot of people are concerned about that. And they are. And I hear that. I think, you know, I'll be honest, I, I try to stay out of the political side of this, but sometimes I think it's a little bit more scare tactic than in reality, uh, because I, I, if you watch the language around what even the most hardcore Republicans are actually saying, uh, virtually everyone wants to keep that provision in place. The methodology for doing that differs among different right. uh, individuals, but v- very seldom do you hear anyone say they're willing to get rid of that provision of law uh, and, and eliminate that. The other thing about that is I think what we might see as well is a sort of broadening of the way that uh, insurance carriers are allowed to address minimal essential, uh, uh, minim- minimum essential coverage ideas. So right now with the, the introduction this year of new rules around, for example, short-term health plans. Uh, 
Um, Which we're gonna, I want to get into that. Too. Yeah, and, and so there are new rules around that that change the way those minimal essential coverages are are applied, and uh, and we might see a broadening of the way insurers can provide plans that fall outside the Affordable Care Act. The you know sort of optional plans that people can buy that don't match Affordable Care Act rules. Okay, there's so much to unpack in a lot of what he just said. And if you're listening this morning, the question is, what can, can you do to protect yourselves against continually changing regulations? What can you really depend on? So we're going to have more on the Affordable Care Act and health care in America and your insurance coverage and your care. So don't go away. You're listening to More Living with Jim Brogan here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. You are listening to More Living with Jim Brogan. During the week, Jim is a financial advisor, an author and speaker with an MBA from the University of Tennessee who specializes in helping people in or near retirement plan for the next phase of their lives. You can reach Brogan Financial during the week at 865-862-6800 or on the web at broganfinancial.com. And now, here's Senior Market Advisor Magazine's 2011 National Advisor of the Year and host of More Living, Jim Brogan. How can you make sure that you have the access to health care you need at the cost that you can afford? How do you insure yourself? How can you protect yourself against continually changing regulations? You're listening to More Living with Jim Brogan uh, right here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. We're visiting with my friend and colleague Kevin Cragenbrink. He, he is managing member of 3 to 99 and CPS leadership. And we're talking about health care insurance benefits, changes in 2019, and how it affects you. And, Kevin, uh, one of the questions I just asked in there is what can people plan for? So how do people protect themselves against continually changing regulations? <laughs> so, uh, it's a loaded question. Yeah, it's a loaded it? question. It really is. It's like, how do you, how do you respond to that? I mean, it, it's really a tough question to answer for a couple of reasons. One, I mean, let's, let's back up half a step there and say most people in America still do get their health insurance prior to Medicare uh, through their employer. Yeah, and actually, I want to mention something on there. Yeah. The vast majority of Americans are either covered through their employer plan or they're on Medicare because they're over 65 and they're retired. That's exactly That's correct. the vast majority. So we're talking about, you know, a small a relatively small percentage. Well, that's I don't right. know what that percentage is. It, it, it estimates somewhere between 10 and 15% of Americans are in that pool of people who don't have coverage either through an employer or Medicare. And of that 10 to 15%, a good portion of those are covered by Medicaid because of income. Right. So in in it's, it's maybe the, one of the ways to answer that question is, you know, we, we have the, the, the access to the marketplace. And for those people who are able to go to the marketplace and apply for coverage and get subsidies, uh, that's probably the best overall method uh, to to sort of hold up against the changing regulations is continue to use that marketplace, take advantage of it, be a part of it, be, be familiar with it. I mean, healthcare.gov has gotten better each year uh, going out there and using that system and, and, and there's lots of improvements there. Some of the premiums have actually come down from previous years. So it's, it's a good system for what it's trying to accomplish, which is make available healthcare, uh, health insurance for those people who don't have access from other places. Let, let's talk about the subsidies. Talk a little bit about the how the subsidies work, what are they based on, how are people eligible, how does that work? Yeah, great question. So the, 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 core, st the, the core method to determine eligibility is the relationship of your annual income to the federal poverty level. And, and so subsidies are available for people whose income is somewhere between 100 and 400 percent of the federal poverty level. And, and those numbers are determined annually. There's a new number every year that determines federal, federal poverty level. And then you calculate your income based on that uh, and whether or not you qualify. And you don't have to do the calculation yourself. Uh, the, the systems in the marketplace will do that for you. Now, in Tennessee, that, that actual 100% is the baseline number for qualification uh, and then up to 400%. In some states, it's actually a different baseline number because if a states have what's called expanded Medi uh, Medicaid, then the, the baseline number goes up to, I think, 164% or something like that of the, of the uh, federal poverty level. But So anybody who's in that range 
qualifies for subsidies at some level. And then there's a, a graduated scale of subsidy available where, depending on where your income falls. Okay, so let's use a practical example. Yeah. Uh, let's say somebody retires early. Yep. So uh, they're not 65. Let's say they're 61, 62. Sure. This might be you listening. You might be looking at retirement or you may already be retired. Um, one of the things I talk about all the time is that we have more impact on our taxable income in retirement than any other time in our lives. And in our 60s, that's especially true. So with good planning, we could really control taxable income or page one income on the tax return. Right. Um, I was talking to somebody a couple of weeks ago that attended one of my classes at the University of Tennessee, the adult education I do. And he, he had to, he was saying that he had to have his income to get the full, he was getting a huge subsidy and he had to have his income above a certain level. But then he, he also had to have it below. And it was a pretty wide swath. It was like from sixteen or 17000 It had to be above that. It couldn't be below that. Maybe that's because of Medicaid. I don't know. But then it also had – and then it couldn't go – it was a big swath. It went up to like – now, he's married. So it went up to like 60000 or something. I'm not using the exact numbers. Yep. So is that – does that sound right? Is that how that works? That's exactly how that works. So if you drop below that 100% of poverty level, you go to Medicaid. And so you're no longer eligible for a subsidy. If you go above the 400% number, you're no longer eligible. So in the middle of that, that 100 to 400% calculator is where you're at. So it's about, it's about just, just around 17,000 on the bottom end in Tennessee. Yeah, so that year. makes sense. He was around, it seems like 16, five and four times that was in the sixties. That's, That's exactly, exactly right. Exactly correct. So I think it's about 17,000 on the low end, about 69,000 on the high end. So a good planning opportunity on a financial plan if somebody needs to get insurance through the exchanges. Yeah. Okay, so what so let's let's just kind of piggyback on that. Somebody retires or sixty one, sixty two, how do they get health insurance? And now they can go on Cobra if their company's large enough and has to provide that for eighteen months. That's correct. Right. But what what do people what are the options? Yeah, well, practically speaking, and have their pre existing conditions covered. That's right. So Cobra's number one. Obviously, but the second option is go on the marketplace. And so when you lose coverage, that creates a qualifying event. So it doesn't matter what time during the year you leave, you leave, leave your employment, leaving employment creates a qualifying event. You go on the marketplace at that point and you now are able to qualify to apply for health insurance on the marketplace. Depending on your income characteristics, you're either going to get subsidies or not. Even if you don't get subsidies, you can use the marketplace. Your rates are just going to be higher. And so you go on the marketplace, you choose the plan that you want. There there are multiple plan options, and you sign up for coverage there. Let's talk about COBRA real quick. Yeah. Very misunderstood. People say, oh, COBRA is so expensive. The COBRA is not any more, I mean, it, the, the, when, when, you quali- when you go on COBRA, and a lot of people understand this, but a lot, there's a lot of confusion. When you go on COBRA, all that happens is you end up paying all the premium rather than the employer paying the premium. It's not like... Now, they can charge an extra 2% to cover administrative costs. So you could end up paying 102% of what you pay. But it's not like... Cobra is more expensive than other insurance. It's you're just paying the bill instead of the employer helping pay the bill. Yeah, they, they, because they, people don't understand that. They think they're getting gouged. That's what your employer's been paying. Exactly correct, and that's 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 an eye opener for a lot of folks to look at that and say, "Wow, uh, the insurance I've been getting is really very expensive." I just haven't been paying all of that because part of my benefits, part of my compensation package, has been what the employer pays. That portion the employer pays for my health insurance. Now, there can be, if you, know, you mentioned it's a qualifying event when you go off COBRA or you lose a job, so it doesn't matter when that happens. But if you don't have a qualifying event, the open enrollment for ACA is, is November 1 to December to mid-December. Correct. In Tennessee. So you're kind of limited on when you can purchase new coverage unless you, if you don't have a qualifying event. Is that where some of the short-term insurance can really come in? It is, and it can be a valuable resource to you if you're caught in one of those gaps where you don't have that. Or, you know, some people, for example, don't know the rules on this. And if you wait more than 30 days after your qualifying event, you also no longer have a window. So you get trapped in that place where you don't have it, and those short-term plans can come into play. But be very careful with short-term plans. So the new rules allow you to have a short-term plan, and you can actually have that plan up to 364 days. Right. And to so, clarify, that was an executive order from Trump. That's exactly and correct. And to clarify, under Obama, it was only 90 days, right. right? Right. And in Tennessee, the limit, so states get to regulate how that actually plays out. 
And in Tennessee, your limit is 360 days, so virtually a year. But those plans do not have to be Affordable Care Act compliant. And most of them are not. So you can buy one of those plans, but you have to be very sure what you're buying. Oftentimes, they have pre-existing conditions exclusions. Uh, Those plans are best as coverage against catastrophic risk. That's how they're best thought of. So I'm going to buy a short-term plan while I'm looking for or waiting for the opportunity to get full coverage somewhere, knowing that what I'm really doing is securing myself against a major accident or the the, uh, diagnosis of major illness like cancer, heart attack, stroke, something like that. So to be ACA compliant, I guess one of the things is it has to provide minimum essential coverage. So that I think project to cover 60% of the costs. Well, that's an actuarial calculation. Right. It's a very complex formula. And, and so that's why there, so when you see bronze, silver, gold, and platinum plans, all of those calculations are things that relate to um, how, how much cost is covered out of a projected cost basis. Okay, and so a bronze plan is supposed to cover 60% of the actuarial cost for that kind of a plan. But it doesn't relate to, it's not trying to say your actual 60% of your actual out-of-pocket or premium costs or anything like that. And so it can be very confusing how the law is written there. The essence of the law, though, for minimum essential coverage says it has to cover pre-existing conditions. It cannot exclude those. It has to provide coverage for your annual wellness visits at 100%. It has to cover well baby uh, visits. It has to cover certain other elements of your care. But beyond that, beyond those basics, that's the end of minimum essential coverage. It has to provide some coverage for things like doctor's visits and stuff like that, but it doesn't have to provide 100% of that coverage. So, um, for example, you might have a minimal essential coverage plan that's going to say, well, we'll pay uh, $80 for three doctor's visits a year. Well, it's a fixed amount they're going to pay. It's $80. It only covers three visits a year. And then anything above the $80 a visit, the patient is still responsible for. And if they have more than three visits, they have to pay for those 100%. So it, it's really a, a difficult it's difficult I, to I guess, understand that. I guess people get a lot of surprises. They don't oh. they don't really understand what they cover and what they don't cover. So it's important that they compare plans and understand what they're paying for and what they're not getting or what they are getting. I mean, you get what you pay for. You do. That's exactly correct. And, and you, you know, there are a lot of plan options out there. People don't realize how many options there really are. And we, we spend probably uh, 60 or 70 percent of our time doing uh, individual education with people saying this is how your plan looks and works and how you actually use your plan. Because most people have never had anyone sit down with them and say, not just here's your plan and what its benefits are, but how do you actually use it and get the most out of those benefits and make sure that you understand what you're getting when you go to the doctor. You know, what can you expect in the terms of billing? Can, can the doctor bill you more than the copay? Can you, or do you, are you responsible for any of the bill past what the insurance company is going to pay? And how does that work out? Yeah, all that's so important, critically important. Now, are retiree health care costs overblown? And how do you plan for them in your planning? Don't go away. We'll have our dollars and cents segment as we visit with Kevin Craigenbrink. He's the managing member of 3 to 99 Employee Benefits Specialty. And we're talking about health care, so don't go away. This is More Living right here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Through his weekly radio show, television news appearances, and adult education classes taught at the University of Tennessee and Pellissippi State Community College, Jim taps into his extensive knowledge and experience to address issues important to living your best retirement. Join Jim every Saturday morning at 9 a.m. here on Newstalk 98.7 WOKI and visit him online at broganfinancial.com. And now, here's the host of More Living, Jim Brogan. Welcome back to More Living with Jim Brogan, where it's all about living the best years of your life your way. We're talking about health care. What are your health care costs going to be? And it is one of the top two or three concerns people have about their retirement. Actually, in a recent survey, it actually was number one among many retirees. Ahead of the idea of running out of money was how do they pay for their health care? So we're visiting with Kevin Craigenbrink. He is managing member of an employee benefits firm, 3 to 99. And we're talking about all the implications of the Affordable Care Act, the future of health care. How, how do you bridge the gap between retirement and Medicare? 
and all of those things. Now, before we get back to Kevin, and as we expand on the health care discussion, it is time for Dollars and Cents. Want to be sure you are getting the most out of your retirement? For all the years of your retirement? That's the primary goal of More Living with Jim Brogan and our Dollars and Cents segment, where we provide you with an important financial tip that will help positively impact the quality of your life in retirement. And now, here's Jim with this week's Dollars and Cents tip. Are health care retiree costs overblown? Let's talk about that. According to a recent study by Fidelity, the average 65-year-old married couple will need a whopping $280,000 just to cover their, their health care costs in retirement. This does not include long-term care needs, by the way. So 280000 You may have heard that number or a number similar to it many, many times. Um, here's the thing. The reality is health care costs are not born as a lump sum on the day of retirement. You don't retire and they say... Pay $280,000 and your health care is covered for life. That's not how it works. So, what, you know, th- th- according to the, as an example, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics Consumer Survey, the average couple spends, over, spends about 17000 per year on food, clothing, and shelter in retirement. But we don't typically report this as a $400,000 lump sum obligation in retirement. And that's how we're kind of tr- trying to talk about. I mean, it's an annual line item expense in your budgeting. Uh, similarly, we don't look at income streams in retirement as lump sum assets either. I mean, if you look at Social Security, the average monthly benefit in America is $1,294 a month. That's nearly $280,000 in income benefits for males and 335000 for females. That's just average and over 600000 for married couples. And meanwhile, couples who earn the maximum Social Security benefit have a combined Social Security lump sum value of over $1.1 million. But we don't think I retire. I've got $1.1 million in the bank. Okay? We don't retire and say, oh, I've got to pay $280,000 in medical costs. So the reality is we have repeated expenses year after year. Now, we go on Medicare. We buy supplements. Those things cost money, and then they don't cover everything. So according to a recent report, a recent joint study between Vanguard and Mercer Health and Benefits, the average annual cost for an individual in retirement is $5,000 per year. So for a married couple, it's $10,000 per year. Now, that's average. You could be lower than average. You could be higher. I'll get to that in just a minute. But the reality is that's what it costs per year. So think about this. If it's 5000 per year and you live 20 years in retirement, that's $100,000 in expenses plus medical inflation. So that's how we come up with the average of 140000 That's how Fidelity came up with that. It was actually a little more than 20-year average. So, you know, but, but we pay it annually. So the way you should be thinking about this is what do you need to be budgeting in your income and expenses in retirement to cover health care? The average is 5000 a year per person. 10000 per couple. So before you retire, what are you spending on those things? You need to have an idea of that. How much are you sharing and having to pay in premium for your medical insurance at work, for you and your spouse? And then what are you having to pay in out-of-pocket every year for your utilization? So, you know, yeah, it's going to cost $5,000 a year on average per person in retirement, but what are you spending now? And then you got to know how to budget that into your income and expense plan to make sure that you're covered. Now, you need to, 5000 is the average. So there are these chronic, common chronic conditions that you could have that drive up your costs. Things like hypertension, high cholesterol, arthritis, heart disease, diabetes, depression, dementia, cancer, asthma, osteoporosis, kidney disease. Those are the, those are the chronic things. If you have zero or one of those, you could end up spending half of the average of 5000 a year. But if you have three of these, it doubles to 5700 a year if you just have two or three of these chronic conditions. If you have six or more of these chronic conditions, you could end up needing six, maybe 10, or even 12 times the expenses. So, you know, your health care is directly related. Your costs are somewhat related to your health. So that's common sense. So, but ultimately, the way you plan for all of this 
is including it in your line item budgeting because it is a monthly and annual expense. So you need to build it into your expenses and then produce an income plan that increases over time that has a high, li- high likelihood of covering these annual medical expenses. That's our Dollars and Cents segment for this week. You can find this week's Dollars and Cents segment and others by visiting BroganFinancial.com. And I would urge you to go to BroganFinancial.com. Uh, you can get, we just have a plethora of information. I want to tell you about my upcoming classes. I've got my next class is March the 5th and 12th at Pellissippi Hardin Valley. It's two-part class, two two-hour sessions. I cover seven key areas to help you plan for a retirement successfully. Now, health care is one of the topics we cover. We get more into Social Security, Medicare, and a few of those other things. We don't do a real deep dive, but we cover all of the main seven areas that you need to be planning for in retirement. Uh, to find out in more information, you can go to PellissippiRetirementPlanning.com. I've got that class on the 5th and 12th at Hardin Valley. I'm out in Blunt County March the 26th and April the 2nd. So if you live out in Blunt County or right off of North Shore, it's a quick, even in North Shore, it's a quick 15-minute, maximum 20-minute drive out to that beautiful campus at Friend, in Friendsville at, uh, with Pellissippi. Then I've got a UT class May 9th and 16th at the Downtown Conference Center. Uh, again, for the Pellissippi class coming right up is PellissippiRetirementPlanning.com. If you want all of my upcoming classes, go to BroganFinancial.com and click on the tab for classes at the top, and you can find out about all of our upcoming classes where I give you just as much information as I possibly can to help you plan for your retirement. And um, by the way, our podcasts are down. We are building... We are expanding our podcast pages to be more user-friendly. Uh, and the reason I thought of that is because I'd love for you, if you didn't catch that dollars and cents on how to plan for health care expenses in retirement, I'd love for you to hear that. But we are down. They'll be up in just a few weeks. Uh, but it's going to be expanded. You'll be able to search by category. It'll be awesome for you to be able to listen to podcasts for dollars and cents and for our radio show. Uh, this morning, we're visiting with Kevin Cragenbrink. He is managing member of an employee benefit specialty firm, 3 to 99, and, and CPS leadership. And we're talking about health care costs and health care planning, insurance benefits, and all of those things. And uh, one trend, Kevin, that's become more popular in recent years is high deductible plans that are coupled with health spending accounts, HSAs, in place of the traditional higher premium low deductible plans. Can you talk about the major advantages and disadvantages of these kinds of HSA plans? Because, And that's a big potential emphasis of the Republican Party of how to cover insurance effectively in the future. Absolutely right. And I'm glad you brought that up, Jim. I was just sitting here. I, it's, we're on radio, so I can't do a diagram for people, but I wish I could. Right. So talk through your insurance this way. Think through it this way. Your costs in insurance are, first of all, your premium cost, then your deductible cost, and then the max, the, the risk factor is that max out of pocket cost. And all three of those are important numbers to consider when you're planning your insurance. When you're talking about a high deductible plan, you're talking about a plan that's got a deductible of somewhere from 3000 all the way up to about $6,500 for deductibles. That sounds like a lot of money. But the real question is not what does the plan provide for, but what are your actual costs? And so actual cost is premium. Plus usage. How much do you actually use it? Which I kind of talked about in the dollars and cents segment. Exactly correct. And so when, when you think about it that way and you realize that for most people, usage never reaches max out of pocket. In fact, for most people, usage never actually reaches deductible in a high deductible plan. The gap that you fill there is something that you can fill with an HSA. Why is that important? Because HSAs are dollars that you own. They go into an account that you control. It goes into your bank. You get to pick where it goes. Or if your employer sets it up, they set it up for you. But it's still your money. It never goes away. And it's tax advantaged. You do not pay taxes on that money when you put it in there. You don't pay employment tax or income taxes on that money. You can use it for your health care expenses. You can leave it in that account until you turn 65, after which point it becomes available for use beyond medical expenses. In other words, doing an HSA and holding that money against future risk is actually a good strategic part of your overall retirement plan. So a couple of quick additional notes on HSAs. 
the money going in is tax deductible. It's tax free coming out. There is no better way to save money from a tax perspective. It's like a traditional IRA going in and a Roth coming out. It's unbelievable. And after you're 65, you can use that HSA to pay for Medicare and other certain expenses. For like your Medicare premium can be used to reimburse for your Medicare. And then if you don't need it, then it does become taxed when you pull it out. But it's like any other IRA. So from a tax perspective, the HSA is actually the best way to save money. Now, they tend to be a little limited on investment options. From a tax perspective, they're awesome. So if you have access to an HSA or can add that into your planning, it becomes very, very effective as a part of a financial plan. When we come back, what about Medicare? What about things like dental and vision and things it doesn't cover? As we discuss the Affordable Care Act and health care costs for you as you age and how you can ensure those risks and plan for those costs. Don't go away. This is More Living with Jim Brogan, only right here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Thank you for listening to More Living with Jim Brogan. If you miss any of today's show or want to listen to it again, visit broganfinancial.com where you can access the podcast and other educational materials to help you in your journey through retirement. And now, here's Senior Market Advisor Magazine's 2011 National Advisor of the Year and host of More Living, Jim Brogan. Thank you for tuning in to More Living here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI as we discuss health care costs and how you obtain insurance in a changing landscape in America. We're visiting with Kevin Cragenbrink. He is a managing member of the employee benefits firm 3 to 99. And uh, real quick, go online, broganfinancial.com, click on classes and learn about my upcoming classes. You know, Pellissippi State and University of Tennessee provide a great environment for you to learn. So you can make informed and prudent decisions to impact the quality of your life. I'm fortunate to, enough to be one of the instructors. And uh, my classes, uh, financialsurvivalforretirement.com at Pellissippi coming up March 5th and 12th. To get the full schedule, go to broganfinancial.com. And I do want to mention, we're at tax time. And if you go to my website, broganfinancial.com, scroll down to the bottom, a review of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Very relevant as you prepare your tax return. And I kind of hit the main highlights of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. I'd love for you to download it. You can download it for free right there on my website, and we'll send that to you. The key is what you do with that information and how you plan for it moving forward. Now, Kevin, let's talk a little bit about Medicare. Medicare itself does not cover routine dental, vision, hearing exams, as well as many of the services associated with them. Uh, Many retirees over age 60 need prescriptions for glasses, hearing aids, and dental procedures. What are their best options? You know, there there are a lot of different options, and I will tell you, Medicare is probably the single most complex element of health insurance uh, out there. There are so many different options and rules and regulations and and policies. Uh, you, the best option I'm, I'm going to say to every person who's on Medicare or thinking about what they're going to do when they get on Medicare, the first thing I would say to them is talk to an advisor, find somebody that you trust who can help you walk through the puzzle that is Medicare coverage. Now, having said that, the the reason reality is there are great coverages out there. And so, you know, you have your basic Medicare that everybody sort of gets signed up on when they sign up on Medicare, but everybody has access to Medicare Advantage plans. Everybody has access to uh, Medicare Part D plans to, to help cover the, the dental expenses and all of those sorts of things. You have Medicare Part F supplement plans. Uh, you have all of the different component pieces of Medicare that, that are available and need explanation. And some of them cost uh, money and some of them don't. I mean, there are some great Medicare Advantage plans right now that you can actually get great coverages that include all sorts of things you couldn't imagine in your regular Medicare plan that have no premium costs for a lot of folks and things like that. And folks just don't know it's available. So again, you know, the best answer to the question, what do I do if I'm on Medicare and I want those other coverages, get a great advisor. Yeah, I think getting guidance from somebody that specializes in Medicare is pretty darn important there. Um, I do want to talk about managing drug costs. That yeah. beca- You got that donut hole in Medicare and Part D. Um, it's a big expense for a lot of retirees especially. But all, a lot of Americans that have a certain condition, some drugs you know, are very, very expensive for even some colitis issues and things like that. 
So managing drug costs, can you talk about some of the best ways to do that, including even our selection of where we get our drugs from? Absolutely. And and can I start with this, Jim? Uh, Especially for the folks on Medicare, sometimes uh, some of the folks I've talked to there don't recognize the advantages of technology for helping manage drug costs. And there's one simple thing. I'd like everybody to write down this. Look up on your internet, GoodRx, G-O-O-D-R-X. And that you can do that on the Internet if you want to, or if you're a smartphone user, you can download an app to your phone. Is it called GoodRx? It's called GoodRx. That's the name of the app. That's the name of the app. I use it for everything. I'll tell you that I have a medication that I take that I was paying $390 a month for my medication because it was not available any other way. Uh, and and that's, that, was the, that was the price I had to pay it. About four or five months ago, GoodRx issued a coupon for that. I now pay $90 a month for that same medication. But even where we get them, I mean, I've seen some studies that drugs could be $83 at a major drug retailer and $12 at Walmart or Costco. That's exactly correct. And in fact, for example, many... Uh, um, and I'm, uh, I'm not saying Walmart or Costco, just be clear, Yeah, I'm not saying Walmart or Costco are better than the main drug retailers. I'm saying that was a specific example. There may be some the other way. That's exactly right? correct. And one of the things GoodRx does is it'll show you 10 places to buy that same medication and show you which is the lowest price. Yeah. Uh, there's that's, a, a great, that's a great reason source. Is yeah. mail order a great way to save money on prescription drugs? Absolutely. If you can get it done that way and you've got the ability to get a 90-day prescription, that's your cheapest model most of the time is to do a mail order 90-day 90 90-day 90 uh, fill on your prescription. Uh, but again, I always would use GoodRx first even to check on that to see. Uh, even if you have a copay plan, sometimes the GoodRx rate is lower than your copay. Now, what about a lot of people go to Canada Is that kind of dangerous? That scares me. Well, it can be dangerous only because the Canadian regulatory body does not have the same levels of uh, regulatory compliance issues or or, or rules that our FDA does. But typically, those medications are safe, but no guarantees. Now, real quickly, Kevin, you know, if a major medical event happens, many people quickly learn that their primary health insurance doesn't cover as much as thought. So supplemental insurance policies have increased in popularity as a method to better protect yourself and your family. Can you talk about the role of supplemental or catastrophic insurance? What is it and what can it cover? That's a great question. And a couple of things about that. The first one is this. Your health insurance it has a max out-of-pocket number that goes with it. And that number, uh, the, the, the most allowable, if it's an Affordable Care Act policy, is $7,900. But that's still a big chunk for a lot of people. What it doesn't tell you, though, is that there's so many costs that aren't included in that that are out-of-pocket costs. If you get really sick and can't work, how do you replace that income? If you're pre-Medicare, how do you, if you're not retired, how do you replace the income that you've lost? And so that's where the supplemental policies come in. And they cover things like accidents or they cover injuries or they cover cancer or they cover heart attack or they cover stroke or those sorts of things. And they function to put cash in the pocket of the individual to use to pay for their expenses. They can use them to pay deductibles or out-of-pocket expenses. They can use it to supplement income or any of those sorts of things. And they can be very, very beneficial and low cost. And I know to piggyback on that, there are life, a lot of life insurance policies now that will advance death benefits to pay for critical illnesses. And, and it kind of supplements and help covering all the ancillary costs that go in with, like if somebody has a heart attack, you can have a lot of ancillary costs that aren't really medical related. Right. And a lot of life insurance policies now, they might advance, you know, a percentage of the death benefit to help cover those costs. Kevin, I know this is the type of stuff you do. We're almost out of time, but how, how can people, I know your company, 3 to 99, helps emplo- small employers, 3 to 99 employees. How can people get hold of you? Uh, in your company. Yeah, great. They can find us on the web at 3to99.com or they can call me directly at 865-804-1556. Okay, and 3to99, that's the number 3 and the number 99, not spelled out. Correct. And then the word 2. T-O. So 3to99.com. Yes, sir. Okay, that's Kevin Craigenbrink, managing member of the employee benefits firm 3 to 99. He's been very, very helpful with uh, his analysis of the healthcare landscape and insurance landscape. Thank you, Kevin, for taking time to be with us. Thank you, Jim. We've discussed your healthcare costs because pr- greater planning for healthcare provides for more living so you can live the best years of your life your way. Be sure to check out our upcoming class schedule at broganfinancial.com. And thank you for tuning in this week as you've been listening to More Living with Jim Brogan only on News Talk 98.7. 
WOKI.